Voice, Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're in Palau, where we meet up with Pat Cullen of the Coral Reef Research Foundation. Some of your um, more famous research is on spawning aggregations of fishes. You're pretty well known in that field. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually an ichthyologist by training, but I love, you know, I, love, I love it all, but you know, I was trained as an ichthyologist, and I went to the University of Miami, Rosenstiel uh, School of Marine uh-huh. Atmospheric Sciences. And, uh, and an ichthyologist is a person that studies fish. Fish, yeah. There's some ichthyologists that are taxonomists. We talked about those. They're like study which the species is different than that. And the best taxonomist in the world is Dr. Jack Randall from Hawaii, Hawaii. Bishop Museum. Uh, he's, he's a perfect example of the ultimate in taxonomist. The guy that goes into the field and yes. does the lab work, yeah. both spectacularly. Yeah. He's <laughs> Which, a modern day person. He wasn't there 150 years ago when everything was new. He's, he, you know, there have been thousands of species, thousands of coral reef fishes described. And now he came along starting in the 1950s and found, you know, he's described almost a thousand species himself. So it's it, his, and then his, his achievements are absolutely remarkable. Gone on to describe yes. a lot also. So yeah. his sort of uh, influence in that area is pretty yeah. remarkable. Yeah, the living legend we call it. <laughs> but so the, you have taxonomists, and then you have people like me, who study the biology of fishes. And to me, you know, I'd go diving out on the coral reefs, and okay, I'd look, this is in the Florida, Bahamas, Caribbean region initially. And uh, you'd go out and you'd say, oh, this species there, I saw this one, I'd never seen it before. Well, after a while, you, you've pretty much seen all the species. So uh, if you're a scientist, well, you can you know, maybe try and go dive deep and try and find some new species or whatever. But you know, that sooner or later, you sort of come up to the point where I'm not really learning anything new. So then many people then focus their attention on something else. Some, say the life history of fish. I like to compare it to what's happened in ornithology and birds where you know people 150, 200 years ago were finding new birds and then uh, they're pretty well known these days but then people now have studied the life cycle of, of birds, where they nest and how they migrate and this sort of thing. So this is what I'm really interested in in terms of fish. So I sort of in the 1970s I decided this is where we need new information about the life cycles of reef fishes and particularly these coral reef fish species like groupers and some of the wrasses, parrotfish that come in, in together in huge aggregations for their spawning. Mm-hmm. So in the 1970s I started working on groupers and, and some of the parrotfish and that's what I'm continuing to do here in Palau. So we have some spectacular things here. This is a recent study uh, on the, uh, the humphead wrasse. Now the humphead wrasse is the largest wrasse in the world it's a spectacular fish. It's, it's what we call the charismatic megafauna. Yes. <laughs> you know, divers want to see this fish because it's, you know, the male is so spectacular. It has the big bump up on the head. And, uh, you know, and it, where they're not harassed or speared, they're very, they can become very friendly, mm-hmm. particularly if people feed them, which is a mixed bag. You know, it's good and bad. I don't personally support feeding ray fishes but alters their behavior. But anyway, it's an iconic species that divers want to see. But we had no idea exactly how it spawned. We knew that, okay, it's going to have little eggs that are externally fertilized and drift away with the current in the open ocean and develop for about a month as a larva and then become a benthic fish, benthic juvenile. But beyond that, virtually nothing. So I've you know, gone and focused. If, if you focus on a particular species, start learning its behavior, well, pretty soon you're gonna learn, okay, it looks like it's spawning here at this time. And I had a few friends in the dive guides and such, they'd tell me, oh, I saw you know, 500 humphead wrasse or whatever at a given place at this time. So that's like a clue, oh, well, maybe something interesting <laughs> is going on. So then you would go out there, say the same phase of the moon or the same tidal state and if hopefully you'll see something going on interesting. So this is what happened with the humphead wrasse. 
I ended up learning that they actually spawn uh, many, many areas. They come together in, in, in aggregations, but there's only maybe 100 fish total in an aggregation. So they're, they're probably 100 or 200 or more aggregations of these fishes all over Palau, because Palau is a big area. But the individual aggregations, they actually spawn most days, almost every day of the year. We're not 100% sure yet, but they come together. Wow. Uh, they're very interesting because they're a sex-changing species. Mm -hmm. And if you can, this example here, this is a female here, about 35 centimeters, about a foot long. This is the male, and he's over a meter long, probably about four feet up to five feet. They get wow. up to uh, oh, about 200 pounds, the males. Anyway, they, they come together. Uh, there are many more females than males. It's what we call haremic. It's not exactly the correct term, but there are many females. So the male spawns consecutively with a whole series of females. So they go through this little... Uh, act where they release the eggs. This is the actual eggs you see here. That's the female. She, she releases eggs. He releases sperm. She dives away, goes back to the reef, and is gone for the day. The eggs are fertilized. There's probably a hundred thousand eggs in that little tiny little cloud there. Those drift away, and then there'll be another female. 60 seconds later, he'll spawn with her. So he'll spawn with a whole series of females in quick succession. And he's doing that every day? Every day. And then he goes, he leaves. So they have a period of about an hour or less every day that they spawn. It's about two hours after high tide, where we know about it. And, you know, most, most days are out there. So this is a fish that, you know, it's interesting because if you're talking about conservation of a species, mm -hmm. well... Okay, it's not like a, a trout where you can go and, and protect the spawning ground in rivers and such, or you know, something else that has a, a discrete spawning season, a discrete lunar phase, so you can protect something in a short term and then maybe protect the spawning population. This fish spawns every day of the year, so and it's, in a, it's broadly distributed, so like protecting one site temporarily on a season or something isn't really going to improve the situation for, for this fish restoring its populations. So instead of that, you have to do something like has been done here in Palau where they've actually placed a ban on fishing this species any time, any place. You can't possess, you can't catch, can't sell humphead wrasse, mamel in, in Palauan. So that's a very good conservation measure. Is there a point in time where the population of the humphead wrasse will get to recover Hopefully, to such a point that they would fish it again? Uh, well, yes, that could occur. Now, here in Palau, the population never crashed. It's not like the Atlantic cod was, had a precipitous decline in abundance. What you had here was a gradual decrease. So the fishermen are saying, oh, well, we're seeing a lot less than we used to, but you could still go out and find this fish if you wanted to catch it. Uh, so that they sort of, you know, acted proactively for a variety of reasons and said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna ban this. And, and worldwide, this species is in real trouble though. Palau is relatively lucky in that they have a, a pretty good population. You go to places like, uh, there are places where it's, it's gone, but it's fished out. Many areas of Indonesia, for example, uh, unfortunately, this is a very popular fish in what's called the live reef fish trade, where sure. fishes are captured alive by usually you know, sometimes local or, or Chinese fishermen. Uh, they're held in pens alive, and then uh -huh. they're shipped to places like Hong Kong alive in, in vessels, and then they're sold. They have aquariums on the street, and you can buy this fish. It costs... Uh, an exorbitant amount of money, a humphead wrasse might be worth $100 a kilo or more in Hong Kong. So a 100 kilo fish, $10,000 or more, and probably more because that's a particularly big one. So that in many areas, the humphead wrasse has been highly impacted by the live reef fish trade. So here, you know, at least here in Palau, we have a good population. We are able to study this so we can understand about, a bit about the life history, and then that information can be used elsewhere to help restore the population. So here, uh, 
So, but they're long-lived fish. They're, they're not hundreds of years old, but uh, to become sexually mature, which is about one foot, it takes approximately five years. Wow. And that would be a female then? That'd be a female. And then at an age of something like uh, nine to ten years, some females, not all, but some females transition to males. There are some females that remain females their entire life. And the, you know, the why sex change occurs is not totally understood. It could be many social factors, but it's sort of, it's sort of like, well, the number of males needed develops and no more. Because mm -hmm. males are point, males are useless, you know, <laughs> beyond helping reproduce you. You only need so many males. Females are much better in many respects. So you, have, you can have big females. They don't get as big as males, but you can have females that are this long, males are this long. And then you can have really tiny females. But anyway, you're looking at at least a decade between spawning and when you will have new males come into the population. And then the fish, uh, the lo oldest ones documented from the, looking at the ear bones are around uh, 25, 30 years of age. That's pretty so they're relatively long lived. They don't live for centuries, but they live for decades. I so it takes decades to see real impact in, in conservation measures. When those females change into males, what does that intermediary fish look like? Do you ever see those? Uh, well, they don't look, they, they are hard to tell. Because as they get bigger, they, the males and females, the young males don't have much of a bump on the head. Uh -huh. So you can be a male, but you, you barely look like a male. So it's not that, it's not an instant distinction. Some parrot fishes and things like that also change sex and there they will change not only the, the sex, they change the whole color pattern mm -hmm. to the point that early on uh, people actually described the male and the female of a given species as two different species because they thought well they have to be different, <laughs> one's blue and one's red, right? Right. So uh, there, are, there are examples there. There they will have like an intermediate color pattern but it takes only a, a few weeks or a couple of months to change sex. These guys, it's much harder to tell. You have to, you actually have to go and sample the gonads and do histology, and look for the you know, male versus female structures in the, in the gonad. Sometimes, you know, when they're intermediate, you have both, going on at the same oh. time. Now, the other thing in terms of spawning aggregations that we also work on are groupers, and mm -hmm. this is a little bit technical here, but uh, interestingly enough, groupers. We have many species here in Palau, have a very different pattern for spawning aggregations, where this is a year-round daily spawner. It's what we call a resident aggregation. They, they come to the same place every day to spawn, so they're resident at that site. Groupers are seasonal, and they also have a lunar, a moon phase mm -hmm. to their spawning, so they will come to a particular area in a channel like this, on a certain phase of the moon in a certain uh, season. Like right now, we're in uh, April. It's the, just the start of grouper aggregation season. And so uh, they come there, they come this particular species. I don't have any pictures of them here, unfortunately. The coral trout and the, uh, what do they call this, brown mottled grouper uh, come together on the new moon. So if you go out there on the full moon, there are fewer fish. There's still a few, but that'd be maybe 20 times as many on, on the new moon, around the new moon. So they come together. And if you can think of uh, these big red dots that you see here, this is a survey we did, and the, the dots represent the density of fish in this particular channel. So that, and you see little tiny green dots here, that's places where there were no fish. I see. So you can, this gives you an idea how the fish are aggregated together. This one is in this area here. Mm -hmm. This one has a, takes up a, a bit bigger area, but they actually overlap. So they're all mixed in together. And I see that's on the same day. Same day, yeah. So this is, this is you know, this is the, we use GPS for, for doing this type of surveys. You know, 30 years ago, there's no way we could have done this. Now we can, you know, we, we know where we are, when we're there, and we can count fish and get densities. And so this really takes us to a whole new level of being able to map out and understand the dynamics of these things. So we'll do this type of mapping 
you know, every day for the, the three species that there and then just successive days. So you can actually see this aggregation form, grow, and then disperse over, say, a period of a week. And we, we also, we look at the physical environment. These are data from things, from tide gauges and current meters. And so we'll look at the physical factors, what the state of the tide is, what the current speed is, uh, the temperature, other things, so we can understand why the fish are, are going to that particular site. Mm -hmm. And this is a, we also are interested, because the eggs are just shed into the water, they're externally fertilized, and as I said, they just drift away with the current. Well, where does the current take those eggs? So that these are some examples. This is the, the western barrier reef of Palau. This is the ocean. This is a lagoon. And these are two examples. This is a place where the humphead wrasse spawns. Uh -huh. This is a place where grouper spawns. Very distinct places. There are no groupers up here spawning. There are no humphead wrasse here spawning. And then we put a, a, a device, it's called a drifter, in with the, when the fish spawn, we throw that in the water. It it's, has like a sea anchor, so it drifts with the water. And this shows where the eggs go uh -huh. over a period of several hours. We don't usually track them longer than that. But basically, they're, they're slowly taken away from the reef out into what we call the coastal boundary layer. These don't go out into the open Pacific Ocean like hundreds of miles away, most likely. They, they probably stay relatively close to the island. There's a lot of plankton, zooplankton that the fish larvae eat in these areas. So it's a nursery ground, but it is relatively close to the reef. And they'll spend about a month in that environment and then they become little juvenile fish, mm -hmm. which are about 10 millimeters, less than half an inch long and they come out of the plankton and they go and take up residence on the bottom. So here you have two different, you know, resident. Now this is what we call a transient aggregation. It's transient because it's not always there, but it's mm -hmm. in the same place, but in the seasonality and the lunar phase is all the same, but they're not always there. So that's the two different styles of, of spawning aggregations of reef fish. So then understanding the, the tides and the currents and the moon phase, the physical properties of the spawning area for the groupers, would that then allow you to predict areas that spawning might occur um, in other places yes. in Palau or other places mm -hmm. in the world? Yes. Yeah, it is. It, it gives us, you know, an idea of, you know, where, where to look for other aggregations if you're studying how many or there are in a given area. And then for conservation reasons, you would look maybe to those areas as also mm -hmm. places for protection. Right, yeah. Here in Palau, for example, this particular group or aggregation, it's in an area that is actually a no fishing zone. And then there's also a seasonal ban. So you have like this aggregation site, this whole area here, it's the Oolong Channel, is a no fishing zone. And then groupers in general, the three species that we're concerned with here, there's a ban on catching them between uh, 1st of April and I think it's the end of August now. That's the known sp the spawning season. So if somebody, say, has another spawning aggregation that's not a protected area, and there are such places here in Palau, there's about a ten, 10 of these aggregations of groupers known. Well, somebody could go there and fish, but there's this ban on fishing groupers or catching groupers. So you have the, the area ban, the seasonal ban. So this you know, works pretty effectively if, as long as the enforcement is there to prevent people from cheating or poaching. works very effectively in protecting these populations. I think it's, it's a little, little t not totally clear, but I think that the grouper aggregations here in Palau, the, the three species, coral trout, brown model grouper, and the camouflage grouper, are, they're either stable or they're actually increasing. So it's a, it is a conservation success story. Wow. Where, you know, protection works, but enforcement has to be there. Now this area, this is patrolled by Karor State. It's in Karor State. There is fairly high level of enforcement. Not perfect. You know, it's 24 hours a day. You know, you can go out there in the middle of the night, and it's really hard to get caught when you're poaching. But generally enforcement is, is fairly effective in that regard. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach. 
serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world a difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CIDG's training routes go back over 40 years. Through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CIDG. Healthy oceans are critical to our cultural, economic, and environmental sustainability in Hawaii. The ocean serves as a source of water, food, medicine, jobs, transportation, recreation, and energy. It controls climate and weather. Kosi Island Earth aims to share this ocean awareness by partnering with local scientists and educators to engage communities and schools in active science learning for an ocean literate population. Kosi Island Earth is working to establish new avenues for connecting research scientists with educators and communities. Kosi Island Earth is enhancing the science and ocean literacy of our island residents and visitors. Kosi Island Earth is connecting scientific research, traditional knowledge, and ocean policy. Kosi Island Earth, bringing together university, government, research, and community partners to improve science education and ocean stewardship in Hawaii.